Okay, so me and Loic um, are going to present to you some of the key findings from this report. Um, and this will feed in nicely to the second half of our day where um, Lucy and Paul are going to take us through some of the recommendations that have come out of the report and what we want to see changed at a national level. So we've heard about some of the whys, why we're doing this report, why it's important, and we've learnt about some of the hows, quite a lot of how we've managed to get the questionnaire out to everybody. And now we're going to talk about some of the what happened, some of the outcomes of the study. So as we've heard already today, the whole point of the project was to provide a snapshot, an overview of the current opportunities for deafblind people in Europe right now. And this is one of the, you know, the first time that this has been done. So we received 27 completed questionnaires from 27 different regions or countries and 27 different accounts of um, what's happening in each country, 27 different sets of information. Now, most of the questions were yes, no answers questions, binary questions, but states were very keen to contextualise most of their answers and provide lots of extra Excuse information. Excuse me, Cara, slow down, please. Slow down. Okay, sorry, I have a reputation for speaking quickly. <laughs> I'm trying to speak slowly. But English is, I'm quite good at English, that's a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so, seven sets of uh, 27 sets of information needed to be analysed. And each of these questionnaires contained different information about the healthcare system, for example, the social care systems, the social welfare systems in each country, the education systems, and the employment opportunities, and of course, the different types of services that are available for disabled people and deafblind people more specifically. So the most difficult issue, of course, was to synthesize this huge range of data. Um, and, thank you, um, and to present it clearly in our report and to present it to you today. It was difficult, but we got there in the end. So we're going to present four key findings that we found that came throughout the data, actually, with very strong themes. Um, but there are many more findings that relate to the individual domains that you'll be able to see if you've got the report with you. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about Thank you, Lyric. <laughs> um, is numbers. How exciting. Um, it's very important to have good numbers when you're doing a project like this. We need to be able to say, who are we talking about? Who are deaf, who, how many deafblind people are there? Is this an issue that affects many people? Or is it an issue that affects few people? And we also hoped that we could say something about the differences between deafblind men, deafblind women, where there are more men than women, for example, what more women than men? We wanted to say something about the age range as well of the deafblind people um, and those kinds of things. So where deafblind people were living, were they living with their family or were they Cara. living with their, on their own? Sorry, God, speed up. <laughs> okay, so all valid questions for, campaign, uh, for campaigning on this issue. So we asked each of the 27 countries and regions to answer this question, is there a specific official census figure for deafblind people? However, just three states answered yes out of 27, which we were quite not surprised at, but we had hoped that we would be able to get more figures about the number of deafblind people in each country. And just one of those states had a figure that came from their national census data, so a figure of the total deafblind population um, within the general population in that country. So we come to our first key finding. We do not have enough data about who is deafblind. The data, it wasn't available in the report. We only had one figure that we could, could have used, but we had no way of knowing whether that figure would be comparable for the other countries in the study. Now, the reasons we may not have good data about deaf blindness may be numerous. Could be, for example, because deaf blindness is complex. Deaf blindness could occur at any time in life, to any degree. And sometimes it's difficult to identify who is deaf blind if you don't know what you're looking for. And especially in the 60 plus population, where many people's deaf blindness goes unnoticed because it's accepted as a natural part of ageing. 
It also may be that deaf blindness is overlooked by our primary caregivers, our doctors and our social care workers, because they're treating a primary condition. Um, there are over 60 known causes of deaf blindness, and some of those um, conditions are very rare and very complex. And sometimes our health professionals will be looking at the other um, issues that this person may be facing and may ignore the fact that they have issues with their sight and hearing. And because there's no, well, very few countries have um, official recognition of deaf blindness as a distinct and unique um, disability, this may have led to some unawareness of, dis of dis deaf blindness as an issue in our society. And of course, a lack of understanding about the barriers that deafblind people will face. So it's easy to see how some of these issues will affect the quality of data that we have about deaf blindness. But one of the kind of the saddest things is that we don't have enough census data, and it would be very easy and very fruitful to include a question in our census and our national censuses about those who have sight and hearing loss or impairments. We also couldn't find any real evidence of health and social care data that we could use to calculate a number of deafblind people. It doesn't exist. They're not, uh, care, care professionals or health professionals aren't required to collect this kind of information. And perhaps what confounds this is because professionals aren't looking at deafblind people holistically. For example, a small example of this is Deafblind people may have to go to an ophthalmologist for their sight loss problems or their sight issues, whereas they would go to an audiologist for their hearing issues. And it's very unlikely that these two professions will communicate with each other and understand the impact of combined uh, hearing and sight loss. So even if self-report surveys, which tend to be one of the most useful um, data sets for us to use to calculate the number of deafblind people. We have to remember that self-report studies are usually administered by paper, sometimes over the phone, um, but both ways which are not necessarily accessible to every single deafblind person. And they may be missing out from stating their deafblindness on these surveys. And finally, on this slide, um, most of the deafblind organisations, they, they provided data about the number of deafblind people that they worked with, but that fewer were um, able to give us information, for example, about the gender of these deafblind people that they, they work with, um, about where they live, if they're living alone, or if they're living with their family, or in perhaps a residential service, um, and what the cause of their deafblindness is, and whether or not they're working. Those kinds of demographic issues, which would be really, really useful for us in deafblind organisations to know. It would enable us to target our resources perhaps a bit better. Um, but it would also it would be useful to, to develop a shared vocabulary because one of the issues when analysing the data was that we were using different words for the same things. And some of the words that we used in the questionnaire weren't understandable in some of the other states taking part. So it would be useful to develop the shared vocabulary. So, you're probably wondering how we got to this number if we didn't have any data. Well, because we didn't have any data, we had to go back and do a bit of a search, see if there's any available data that we could use. And we went back to the literature to see if actually any other studies had been undertaken that we could use to help us calculate this number. So we used a study that was um, undertaken in 2010 in the UK by the Centre for Disability Research. And the researchers in this study had used data from a range of surveys that had been undertaken in England and Wales that, was, that would enable us to know a bit more about this deafblind population. And the authors had pooled the data so that they, they used data from various surveys in order to have a bigger, more robust data set that they could use to, to provide this figure. And they presented this in their report in 2010 in 10-year age bands from 0 to 90 plus. So as we knew already, um, deaf blindness is more uh, common in older age as people's eyesight and hearing begins to deteriorate. So the biggest proportion 
in their calculations were the over 65s. So we decided maybe these prevalence rates would be useful for our study. So we, as well, we separated each of the populations from each of the 27 states into those aged 65 and under, and those 66 and over. And we applied an average calculation uh, prevalence rate to each of those populations. So, for example, we 0.2% of under 65s may be deafblind, according to this research study. And an average of 2% of 66-year-olds and over may be deafblind, according to this research. So clearly this is a huge number. I don't know whether any of us were expecting, perhaps, for this number. But it shows that deafblindness is real, it's there, it shouldn't be invisible anymore. Many more people are, are dealing with issues with their sight and hearing. And that's because we're ageing, we have an ageing population. It's going to increase, the instance of deaf blindness is going to increase. And we have more children that are surviving prematurity and surviving childhood illness. And all of this, these marvellous medical advancements, they're just they're adding to um, the numbers of deafblind people and potentially the, the work that we do in deafblind organisations. We have many more people to support. We need many, much more funding, much more interest and commitment to the cause of deafblindness. So, before I pass on to Loic, um, I just want to say a few things about the limitations of this study as well. Um, it's not perfect. This number isn't perfect, but it's the best that we had. It's the best that we could do under this situation. And unfortunately, we couldn't calculate our own number, which would have been great. <laughs> we would have liked to have done that, but we just didn't have the data, unfortunately. Um, the authors in this study found the same issues. They found a lack of data from the census, a lack of health and social care data. And again, the only um, evidence was from self-report surveys, which we know may discourage deafblind people from, from taking part in. Okay, so the second key point, it's about services that we found that they are ra rarely deafblind specific. They do not take into account issues with communication, mobility, and access to information. <coughs> Even essential services may not be accessible. For example, general practitioner's appointment, which is not necessarily accessible to deafblind people who must use the phone, internet, or face-to-face -to, -face to get an appointment. And rarely, if at all, there is communication support available during the appointment. Deaf-blind people must access services for the deaf or the blind. For example, as well, education services such as school. There is an inconsistent education, educational option for deaf-blind children and adults across the majority of Europe, including a lack of dedicated deaf-blind specific option. Often, deaf-blind children must go to the school there at are for visually or hearing impairment and are not school for deaf-blind children. What is the issue here? Is the lack of specially trained educators and the lack of statutory funding for deaf-blind specific services. This will mean that deaf-blind people will not receive appropriate support. Third key point, a legal right does not mean a practical right. As we can see, right for support for deaf-blind people does not, does, do not materialize in practice. As Jill mentioned already, deaf-blind people may be prohibited from exercising the right to vote. They must proactively request support for voting. If support is available, they, have, they apply for this service. Most of the time, accessibility rights relate to physical accessibility and not sensory accessibility. Fourth key point. Deafblind people may need extra support to access services. Application and assessment systems are not accessible to deafblind people. They must spend a high proportion of their income on support. 
Most of the time, they might be missing out on payments because of, ex in of inflexible bureaucracy. Without more communication support for deafblind people, there is too much reliance on family and friends to provide services. Deafblind people may need extra communication support. This should not mean that allowance can only afford this support if other support is more necessary. So a communication fund would support this. Finally, um, this project is a starting point. We're really proud that we've managed to get this far in the study. We're very proud that we managed to get all of our representative organisations here and working together. But this is our first attempt. We've never tried anything like this and this big before. Sometimes the tool was inflexible, sometimes the questionnaire was inflexible and didn't suit the contexts of every country. But that's because of the variation, of course, between the cultures, the infrastructures, the vocabulary, etc. We must, in the future, develop a tool to measure these types of developments and opportunities, to see if anything changes as a result of this project, and to keep an eye on what's available for deafblind people throughout Europe. And of course, we must do more in-depth research into each of the individual domains. There's something very interesting going on, for example, in education, the differences between the provision for education in each of the countries, and on it goes for goods and services, for employment, for everything in the survey. There were differences, and we must learn from each other. And this will just ensure that the needs and the experiences of deafblind people across Europe will be better understood, and which could lead to better funding and support, and of course, we hope a better quality of life for deafblind people. So, just to reiterate the key points, we need more data about deafblind people. We need more deafblind specific services. Services themselves need to be more accessible or communication support as well, sorry, as well as communication support is necessary. And we need legal rights to be put into practice. No longer can we accept that these rights exist if we can't actually put these rights into action. That's everything. Thank you very much to all of the respondents who took part in the survey. Your input was greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you both.